so I'm, I'm working with these students and these students, the millennials that I'm finding, and this is uh, why I took the university track, because I knew that the real power of this religious tradition, see, the real power is not in the institutionalization of all of this. The real power is still in the rituals. It's still in the prayer traditions. It's still in the mystical traditions. It's still in the lives of the saints and the martyrs who engage us into a, a longing for God as a long and extended preparation for death so that even while we're alive, I say to my students, and this is going to be there, they, 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 I, I have them memorize little parables that I've made up. So one of them is that the life journey through its through, its, um, through all of the experiences, the heartbreak, the romance, the disappointment, the sickness, the weakness, the successes, the births, the joys, the ecstasies, all of them are really, as Socrates even said, one long preparation for dying. And Christianity has as its centerpiece the, the death of the Lord. We say it at our services, our rituals, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death. It's a long extended dying, and here's the, here's the parable I ask them to memorize, a little proverb. Die before you die, so that when you die, there's not much left of you to die, and then you can truly live until they bury you or cremate you. <laughs> and I have them memorize that. And, uh, and, and, and slowly these young students, which I have the pleasure of teaching, are understanding this because they're dying psychological deaths, many of them. A lot of their friends commit suicide or are on the verge of suicide. There's a lot of pain, but pain, and this is why I love teaching this, it's an opportunity without religious jargon and to help them understand that the human mechanisms of pain can become portals like those moments of entry and the veil can lift in those moments. But somehow, it, it, the, the students, and this is why I, I work with them on the interior life, uh, we practice some sort of, of, of quiet breathing to teach them a tradition that's not only in the Eastern religions, but in Christianity. We have the Jesus prayer, we have the contemplative Carmelites prayer. We have interiority, and without interiority, we do end up creating the idolatry of settling for life without enchantment. And, and, and so that's why when the bishop asked me, where do you want to go to school? I said, I'd like to go to Louvain so I could become a, a professor, teacher, a teacher of these rituals, but more than the rituals, teacher of how these rituals unveil or are portals to this mystery of the mystery of, of, of a divine communion with the beloved that enravishes us. Like John Donne, you know John Donne in the Holy Sonnet number five, I believe, he says, for I neither holy nor chaste will be unless, O oh God, you ravish me. That great line. So this is part of this. Uh, yes, yes. This is part of that reason I became a teacher, yes, to engage yes. them in that exploration of themselves. Because it's all here, you know. And even these bells, these bells um, that are ringing now from the bell tower of this church are a public declaration of the passing of time. And I spent uh, 10 days with Thich Nhat Hanh on a retreat with Martha Howard. She invited me to go on a Buddhist retreat at the seminary up in Mundelein in Illinois here. Up in Mundelein. <laughs> and we're 10 days in silence, eating in silence, listening to Dharma talks by, by, the, the, by the, the teacher every, every day, twice a day. And we meditated for hours, hours. And, uh, and it was a wonderful beginning for me to become aware of the fact that the interior life 
is what is essential for any legitimate ritual to come alive.